get into one of these studies. So uh, check that out. And if you're interested, there'll be more uh, information to come. Right, Chris? Right. Sign up to outside. There you go. And uh, that being said, I just would like to say hello to anyone here for the first time. Any guests? Hello.
So we're going to be looking in Romans today. You take your Bibles in your hands and go with me to Romans chapter 1, 16 and 17. And the title uh, is going to be the Gospel. We're going to talk about the Gospel and what the Gospel is this week and next week. So this will be part one. We're going to cover... Uh, three key points on the gospel today, and then we're going to look at the four points next week as we go through the book of Romans. If you're visiting us today, we welcome you, and we literally go going through the Bible week by week, verse by verse. We're in Genesis right now, just about wrapping up Genesis on Wednesday nights here, and we are going through uh, Romans here on um, Sunday morning. So Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, the word of our Lord. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And Father, on this day in this gospel church, I pray, Lord God, that People have come here today, Lord God, and they have gathered into this church, this gathering. May the gospel, Lord God, be in them. And not merely them just being in a gospel church. And may it live in them with all of its power and all of its might of the Spirit of God and our Lord Jesus Christ. May it transform them, renew them, and give them the, the power and the boldness, Lord, to proclaim it to the world. A world, Lord God, that is dying, a world that is lost, a world, Lord God, I believe, that has little time left before you come. So use us, Lord God, because the harvest is plentiful and the workers are few. May you raise up many harvesters today and laborers to go out into the fields. Let it be for your glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Be seated. So again, the key word here that I want you to focus on is the gospel. What is the gospel? And we will talk about a definition. The Greek word for gospel is evangelical. Okay? It is used in, uh, in a noun form 76 times in the scriptures. It is used 54 times as a verb. And basically, what does it mean? It means good news. It means good news. Yeah. It's, this, it's the good news of the Lord. In fact, it's the best news. Really, it's the best news that has ever been given. It is fantastico. It is wonderful. It is awesome. It is amazing. It is incredible news. And it is centered in who? Jesus. Jesus, right? It is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is essentially, really, if you want to look at the gospel in the life of Jesus, it's his birth, it's his life, it's his miracles, it's his teaching, it's his death, his resurrection, it's ascension, and it's his second coming. When a lot of people talk about the gospel, they will focus on just merely Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. But if you really want to understand the gospel in its fullness, the gospel is the entire word of God. The gospel is the word of God from the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation. It is everything in between. It is the 66 books that were written over the course of 2,000 years by 39 different authors. An integrated message system that speaks to us about God's love and God's saving grace and forgiveness. I want to share something with you. I want to share something with you for a moment as, as we just understand really the, the, the gospel and again understanding it in the entirety of the scriptures. The word of God is a device. You really want to understand this in modern terminology. It is a, a device. And um, it is a de device that God basically gives to us to which we can receive messages from him. We see, receive revelations from him. We see power from him. So I don't think there's a person in this room who does not have one of these. Okay, Maybe I was the last one in the church to get one. And um, the iPhone, or whatever brand you have, is essentially, it is a device and it's used to communicate. You use it to communicate and essentially get info okay, from other people or other sources. When it comes to a device to communicate with God, that's what the scripture does. Now you look, look at the time that we're in because we are in a time of massive deception in our world. And I mean, see many people who come to the church who were basically caught up in this stuff before they gave their life to Christ and renounced the devil. And um, these are devices, by the way. These are all devices condemned in the scriptures by God and, and strongly condemned. In fact, if you 
look at Deuteronomy chapter 18, 9 through 14, God warns his people when you come into the land which the Lord your God is, is giving you, you shall not learn to follow the abomination at three times. The abominations of those nations, there shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or daughter pass through the fire. That's child sacrifice. One who practices witchcraft. One sister who gave her life to the Lord here last year and became a member of the church. I was sitting with her this last week and she said to me, before she gave her life to Christ, she was getting heavily involved in witchcraft. Or a soothsayer, or one who interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or one who conjures spells, or a medium, or a spiritist or one who calls up the dead. For all who do these things are an abomination to the Lord. Not only are they an abomination, but the person who is doing them is an abomination to the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord your God drives them out from before you. You shall be blameless before the Lord your God. For these nations which you will dispossess, listen to soothsayers and diviners. But as for you, the Lord your God has not appointed you uh, such for you. I just wanted to ask this question. All these different... Um, these different Essentially, uh, devices that uh, are talked about here in, in Deuteronomy chapter 18. What do they do? Why does God say that they are abominations and those who are doing them are abominations? Why does God do that? Well, because they're doorways to the demonic. They open up doors to the devil and to the demonic, to the, uh, demonic realm. The word of God is a device that connects you with God. It is a device that puts you in communion with God. So understanding that the gospel, this, this precious book that God has given us, it gives us the opportunity to communicate with God. Of course, to communicate with God, essentially you have to know how to connect to the scriptures. And the connection is, is essentially we connect uh, to the word of God for who? For oh, Jesus. Man. Jesus is uh, our connection. If you're, not, if you're not connected to Jesus... This book is meaningless to you. I guarantee that if some of you are sitting here and some people who have sit here for years who have never given their heart to Jesus Christ, and that, that is mind-boggling to me because I can think of a thousand things I'd rather do if I was not in Christ than sitting in a church on a Sunday morning. But people will come here and they have not given their heart to Jesus Christ. They have not taken Him into their life as their Lord and Savior. And basically, just it, it's meaningless to them. It's meaningless. They're resisting it. They're, they're not receiving it. And... So simply the scripture says, the man without the spirit can't understand the things of God. So once you take Jesus into your life, and you get into the same frequency as the Holy Spirit, and you have to be on, on his frequency, you have to be in tune with the Holy Spirit, or again, the word doesn't make sense. And when you are, you'll find God is speaking to you. And every time you come to the Word, God is going to speak to you. This morning in my time with the Lord, I had a couple of hours this morning before I come to the church, and God spoke, I mean, I was in the Old Testament, I was in Psalms, I was uh, in Proverbs, I was in Numbers, I, I was in 1 Corinthians, I was in Revelation, I'm in Hebrews. In Hebrews 5, God just spoke because the word to me is so wonderful. In Hebrews chapter 5, verse 2, it talks about the high priest and it says that he can really have compassion with the people of God because he has weaknesses just like they have. And that spoke to my heart because when a pastor is identifying with his own weaknesses, suddenly he can look down and he can identify with the weaknesses of people. The more I'm aware of my weaknesses, my sins, my failures, it's easier to relate to people who are uh, failing in sin. When the pastor loses sight of that, and he becomes a judgmental Pharisee. Suddenly he puts himself up higher than the people. It's a beautiful verse about... Just how a, a priest or a pastor can identify with people as long as he stays in tune with, with God and is humble before him, realizing that he's a sinner as well as everybody else. So then just the Holy Spirit just spoke, spoke a very powerful word into my life. Again, when you're on his frequency, you'll get that every day, and it'll be personal. That was extremely, I mean, God got personal with me. So what we're going to look at over the next uh, few weeks, we're going to look at, there, there are seven key aspects to the gospel. We'll look at three of them today. The gospel of boldness, the gospel of Christ, the gospel of power. And then next week we'll look at the gospel of righteousness, the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of grace, and the gospel of peace. So the first that we're going to look at is, is the gospel of boldness. And in verse 16, we have Paul saying, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. I 
believe a person who really receives, truly receives the gospel into their heart, and they receive Jesus into their heart, Holy Spirit, His power and His strength, I, I don't believe that a person who has truly received the fullness of the gospel into their heart will ever be ashamed of that. We're ashamed of Him. And there are two, two great aspects of boldness that we see in the scriptures. One is the boldness of our confession. When, when we have received the gospel into our lives, we will have a boldness of our confession. In Matthew chapter 10, 32 and 33, and I think Jesus makes this plain, Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I also will confess before my Father in heaven. Whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father in heaven. The person, the person who confesses Jesus before other people is a person who has truly received the gospel. They're saved. They're indwelt by the Lord. They're indwelt by the Spirit of God. They're born again. They have fallen in love with Yeshua. And they will speak boldly for Christ. When, when I got saved, and uh, three men were in my wedding party, and we were buddies, I immediately felt the, the urge to go to them and share the gospel with them. Sue and I we sat down with uh, two of them and their wives at dinner. And when I, I mean, I believe some Christians are obnoxious in the way they share the gospel. We were not obnoxious. We were actually very gentle. But we shared the gospel, that we have given our lives to Jesus Christ, and we have been born again, and that we wanted to share the same good news with them because it was just, it filled us with joy, and it filled us with wonder. And... Danny, Mitch, and Brian, they just rejected us. In fact, I, I never saw them again. But we had that, that boldness to, to, to share with them. And a true Christian who has been born of God will have boldness to share the gospel. If you do not have that boldness, I'll tell you, stop and look at yourself. You may not have been born of God. You may not have truly received the gospel into your life. Because that's what Jesus is saying. He who confesses me before men, right? I'm going to confess them before my Father. That's a person who has been truly born of God. The gospel is living in them. And the person who denies me, if he's going to deny them before the Father, I would say that's a person who has never truly received the gospel into their heart. And listen, not everybody is the same. You know, it's Pastor Sam. He's as bold as a lion. Right? You just say, I mean, that's just Sam. He's got a gift of evangelism. Bold as a lion. And that doesn't mean you have to be Sam. Some of you are more quiet. Some of you are more introverted. But if you have truly been born of God, and the Spirit is living in you, and the Gospel is living in you, you're going to have a boldness to share the Gospel. And it will work through that, that personality that God has given you. And again, not everybody is the same. So you may be sitting there, and let me just, I'm going to answer a question here for you. You may be sitting there and saying, well, what about Peter, Pastor Frank? Peter denied the Lord three times, right? Peter denied the Lord three times. So, I mean, is Jesus wrong? Am I wrong? By saying that if you have truly received Jesus into your life in the gospel, that you will have a boldness. Suddenly Peter had no boldness, and it was really before, I mean, these weren't Roman soldiers. These weren't the temple guard who gave Jesus a beating, uh, this was a little girl of 14 years old who said to him, I know you, you were with him. And he said, I do not know the man. The man. So what's up with Peter? Does anybody have an answer for that? What? But still, he denied the Lord three times. I'm saying that a person who has the gospel living in them, the spirit of God living in them, they will not. They they will speak out for the Lord. The Holy Spirit. He wasn't born again yet. Jesus said that he had to die on the cross and be raised from the dead for the Spirit to come, and he wasn't born again yet. And when did that happen? That it happened in Acts chapter two when Jesus breathed the Holy Spirit into him, and then he got clothed with the Holy Spirit at Pentecost in Acts chapter two. And what does Peter do? He stands up in front of thousands of people who had come, right? They had come for the, for the celebration of Pentecost from all over the world. And he stands up and he preaches the gospel with complete boldness. He's no longer that little fearful little lamb. 
He's now been filled with the Lion of Judah. And he speaks the word of God with boldness. In Acts chapter 4, he and John are arrested. Mm -hmm. And they're basically threatened by the Sanhedrin and the Pharisees. They said, if you speak about this Jesus, we're going to give you a beating. We're going to put you to death. Notice what Peter says. When Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. We cannot keep it in. It is bursting forth from our hearts. And that's what happens when a person has truly received the gospel into their heart. Don't be one of those people who stand before him. He said, look, we did this, we did that. He says, I never knew you. Don't be one of those people. Because I think there's going to be a lot of those people who are sitting in churches today all across this land who are going to stand before him and he's going to say, I never knew you. Don't be one of those people. You, you take him into your life as your Lord and Savior. You give him your heart. You allow him to begin to work. Because there are no, no secret believers in the kingdom of God. Mm. Even though sometimes I see Christian people that go out and in church that... Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. They go out and they gather together in a restaurant to pray, and all of a sudden it's like. <laughs> you ever been in that in that situation? All of a sudden they're afraid. There are no secret believers in the kingdom. So it, it is it is a boldness of confession. And it is also a boldness of our procession. What is what is procession? What does a procession mean to what? To move forward. So when we, we do a wedding here, the procession comes down the aisle. You get, you know, the ring bearer comes down and the bridesmaids come down and the flower girl comes down and the bride comes down with her father. And that is a, a, a procession. A procession means to move forward. And the gospel gives us a boldness to move forward to the Lord. So in Hebrews chapter 4, 14 through 16, seeing then that we have a, a great high priest, who is Jesus, who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. And what it says, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. Of need. There is the King of Kings, surrounded by the heavenly angels. In fact, if, if an angel appeared to most of us, we wet our pants. Especially those cherubim that are mentioned in Isaiah. Apparently there are different levels of angels. But whatever Isaiah was seeing there, Isaiah was freaking out. So you have the, the King of Kings upon his throne and the heavenly hosts all around him. It says, let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Mm. Boldly. Mm. To proceed forward boldly and come to the throne of grace. I want to tell you, I do that every day. Every day. Your pastor comes boldly to the throne of grace. And I am totally and completely and absolutely unworthy of his love and his forgiveness and his salvation and his grace. But it's the gospel that empowers me to boldly come forward and receive his mercy that I desperately need every day, his grace that I need every day, to come to his throne and obtain that. And it's because of Jesus and what he's done for me on the cross, it's not because of anything I have done. I can come boldly to Him for what I need for me. Because six hours one Friday, He hung on a tree. And that's why I can come forward. And that is, that is again, the boldness that the Lord puts into our hearts. He gives us a boldness of a lion to confess and, and not to be ashamed of Him. 
before men, and he gives us the boldness of a lion that we can come into his presence, right to his throne, to receive the grace and mercy and forgiveness that we desperately need. So it is the gospel of boldness. Number two, it is the gospel of Christ. So in verse 16 again, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Again, it is the gospel, it is the good news, and we see Christ is the Greek word, the Hebrew word is what? Messiah, the Meshach, Meshach. Um, but it is the gospel of Messiah, the good news of Messiah, the good news that essentially was proclaimed throughout the Old Testament, throughout the uh, Tanakh, and the Jewish people in Jesus' time were anxiously and uh, expectantly waiting for Messiah to come to liberate them and, and to free them. They had been under the oppression of Assyrians and Babylons, uh, Babylonians and, and, and the Greeks and the Persians and the Romans. And they're anxiously waiting for Messiah to come and to deliver them from their enemies, to deliver them from their oppressors, to heal them, renew them, save them. How did they miss him? How did so many of them miss him? Not all of them, but many of them missed him. And the belief is by the end of the, the first century, there could have been as many as 150,000 Jewish believers in Israel. And then it was dispersed by the Romans. But how did they miss him? Because they were looking for a political Messiah. Right? They wanted a Messiah who would shed Roman blood, and they got a Messiah who would shed his own blood. They were looking for a Messiah who would conquer the Romans, and they got a Messiah who would conquer their human hearts. So they missed him. But he came. And he came as Messiah, bringing the good news. What is the good news? John chapter 3, and we're all familiar with this verse, verse 16. Some of us are not so familiar with the verses that follow. It says, for God so loved the world. By the way, that's us. He's not in the real estate business. That he gave his only begotten son. That whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's the good news. No one need to perish. No one need to go on being condemned and end up separated from God for eternity in a place called hell. Now verse 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Look at this verse. Why did Jesus come and not condemn the world? It's already condemned. Right? Because we're already condemned. We, we are already condemned. Every human being is condemned. In verse 18, he who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. You know where the human race is? This is the human race. The human race is on death row. The human race is on death row. The human race is waiting to die, and they are waiting to be sent to hell. And it's not just, you know, we, we, we again, we get away from the Word of God, and then we create our own little theology. Some of them have eventually become full-blown into full religions, but it's not just a place for Hitler mm -hmm. or the child abusers or the rapists, or the murderers. The Bible makes it very clear, right? For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And you can pick and choose your sin, or sins. Is there anyone here who has never sinned, or not sinned? We get people at times, I'm not so bad. Let's just take the third commandment. Have you ever blasphemed the name of the Lord? What if we had that on camera and we played that. Some of us would be here, right? We would be here for a number of days. Have you ever lied? Or stolen? Or coveted? Right on and on and on you go. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Everyone. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death. It's death. Physical death is the body being separated from the soul. The person dies, the soul goes somewhere, either to heaven or to hell. But spiritual death is the soul being separated from God. 
That's described and called hell. It's called uh, Sheol at times, Gehana. It's called the Lake of Fire in Revelation. Uh, it's a place of darkness and it's a place of total separation from God. And the good news is the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ. Let me just say something to you. I want to emphasize something to you. When we share the gospel with people, if you do not under, if you do not share the law with them, they will not know what the heck you're talking about. And that's why that's why I think so many so many conversions are false conversions, and we see it. You see people that supposedly accept Christ, and you know you don't see any fruit from their life. They don't ever go on to get involved in you know in the work of God and the gospel and the church. Nothing. And if you do not stress, it, when, when the gospel is preached in the book of Acts over and over again, there was always first an emphasis on the law. Explain the law. The law brings condemnation. We have fallen short of the glory of God. We've sinned. We've broken his law. And then when you share grace, they realize why they need a savior. But I, I see people, oh, you know, yeah, yeah, I preach the gospel. All these people came to Christ. I say, well, where are they? Where are they? And I would really wonder whether they were truly converted. Maybe, again, the, the, the gospel is not being preached. It's like, hey, you have this, and come to Jesus, it's going to make you happy. Come to Jesus, and, and you know what, you're going to get a better job. Come to Jesus, it's going to make your marriage better. Come, come to Jesus, and you're going to, you're going to, your teeth are going to get brighter. Come, come to Jesus, and you know what, you're going to, you're going to like, you know, get bank accounts get increased. Come to Jesus, and your you know, stock portfolio is going to take away. Listen to some of the stuff that, that you know, just come to Jesus. That, and they come to Jesus for all the wrong reasons. We come to Jesus because he's the Savior. Now, this new guy preaching out in Westchester one day, a well-known radio evangelist, and I'm listening to the guy, and let me tell you something. I mean, he must have made like 52 promises to everybody sitting there. I'm going to say, just, he promised them everything. Come to Jesus. And, and I'm sitting there, and I'm going, he never explained the law, and he never explained that Jesus was a Savior to save us from sin and hell. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ. It is eternal life through a Messiah. So when Jesus begins his ministry, he goes up to Nazareth. He was in the synagogue that he grew up in. And he takes the scroll of the dead. And this is like many scrolls. And he takes the scroll of Isaiah that's handed to him. And the reading that day was Isaiah 61. Isn't it funny how things were just arranged? <coughs> and in Luke chapter 4, verse uh, 17 and 19... And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah, and when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Not talking about the economic poor. Talking about those who are poor in spirit. Those who know they need a savior. Right? The, the people who are not poor in spirit are the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes and the religious people who think that they're just fine in their religion. That somehow they can work themselves to heaven. And it was the sinners and the tax collectors and the prostitutes who were the poor in spirit who were coming, and he was able to forgive and he was able to save. And he has sent me to heal the broken heart, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. That's Messiah's work. He came to set us free. Free from what? Free from our sins. See, free from the penalty of our sins. Free from condemnation. Free from hell. And, and that is the good news of the Messiah. That we were on death row, condemned, and when we received him, we were set free. And instead of an eternity of hell, we are given an eternity of heaven. And there he stands. And again, that is his gospel. It is the gospel of Yeshua. It is the gospel of Jesus. Third point, the gospel of power. Uh -huh. So we have the gospel of boldness, the gospel of Christ, and the gospel of power. And it says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God to salvation. For everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. Now I want to, I want to share this with you. There are, there are two aspects to power. There is defensive power. And there was offensive power, right? Ace, Ace could describe that. He's a martial arts expert. So you have you have a defensive power and an offensive power. A picture of a good defensive power. You remember Muhammad Ali? When Muhammad Ali was especially younger, 
If you remember his fights against Sonny Liston or Jerry Quarry, it was amazing that he was a man who weighed 220 pounds and he moved like a lightweight. He moved like Sugar Ray Robinson or Sugar Ray Leonard. He could move and he could, at least they couldn't hit him. Remember Sonny Liston trying to hit him? He's, he's this big 240 pound bear, they called him the bear, and, and just Muhammad Ali moving from side to side, he's, you know, he's bobbing and he's weaving and he's dodging and he's in and out, and just when he thinks he's able to hit him, he's gone. That's great defensive power. Great offensive power. As a boxing fan, I don't know if there was anybody I'd ever seen with more offensive power than Mike Tyson. Mike, these, these fighters, when Mike Tyson was fighting every week, they were terrified to win the ring with him. The fighters were terrible. See, this past week, a guy, he walked, he walked out of the ring right, the, right, right before the fight. It was the funniest thing. They weren't paying him enough. He just walked out. Everybody was flabbergasted. He just he said he wasn't being paid enough. I mean, you know, how much can you be paid to be knocked in the head like that over and over again? But the, the, the fighters who were fighting, like, I mean, they were so tempting. Some of them, he just, like, his breeze of his fist knocked them over. They were so terrified. But I've never seen a, a fighter as, I mean, as terrifying as Mike Tyson, he was just he was an, uh, an offensive weapon. So you have defensive power and you have offensive power. And the gospel has tremendous defensive power and tremendous offensive power. In fact, if I had to, to say, if I compared the gospel with something, I would compare it to an end, which is unbreakable, indestructible, invincible, and unpenetrable. Like something, something, when I was an atheist, the one thing, it's like God, God was just so it's an amazing thing. Shanna was talking to me about her getting caught up like in witchcraft right before she came to Christ. My two favorite songs right before I came to Christ was uh, Sympathy for the Devil and Hotel California. I used to play those every time I was going back and forth to the gym to work out. The devil was like, trying to, but I, I, at the time, the Holy Spirit, for a year, I opened my heart and I started to question things. And one thing that I, I questioned was, for 2,000 years, the gospel, the Christian faith, was attacked. I mean, you talk about a, a barrage of attacks from the intellectuals, from the philosophers, I mean, persecutions, murders, I mean, genocides. And how it not only survived, but it thrived. It's like just an anvil getting hit with, with hammer after hammer after hammer, attack after attack, being bashed, being struck. The attempt to destroy it. I just want to give you a couple of, uh, of points here. In the uh, second century, Celsus attacked the gospel using his genius. And there are many, many, many others who have used. I mean, they understand this about genius. A genius gets kind of caught in or, or captivated by a, a school of thought, or essentially a, a specific discipline. <coughs> Some people are, are able to go into multiple disciplines. Thomas Aquinas, one of the last men on earth to master thinking in, in many different areas, because now it's, you know, with knowledge. Basically, it doubles every three years. It's impossible. But um, Greek minds, and by the way, you can be in a train of thought that's totally wrong. And you can be a genius in that train of thought. So, you know, if, if, if 2 plus 2 equals 10, and, you know, 3 plus 3 equals 19, you could be caught up in that train of thought and be a brilliant thinker in that specific train of thought, but it's completely wrong. Which I believe is what you find in all the isms and the ideologies in this world. They're wrong. So Celsus was this, this brilliant thinker and he attacked Christianity based upon, again, his intelligence, but uh, he failed. And the Christian gospel just continued to permeate the world in the second century. Maybe one of the fastest times of growth in, in, in the time of the church. But he failed. And, and all who had followed in his path had failed. Um, in the third century, Pophori, he came and he used philosophy to attack the gospel. And again, he failed. As uh, the philosophers had failed to the centuries, whether it's the rationalist philosophers or the skeptics, or you get into fideism, existentialism, relativism, they failed. The gospel's still thriving like never before. 
Lucian uh, of Sarasota. Lucian, he used satire. Clever comedic satire to attack uh, the gospel, and he failed. And so has every other person who has used satire to attack the gospel in the last 2,000 years. More recently, just look at this guy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you saw the movie, what, what just angers me, he's a clown. He's a clown. He's a comedian. He's a clown. And he picks these really dumb Christians to interview. And some Christians are really stupid. I just want you to understand. They, they don't have a clue. They don't know the word of God. They've never read the Bible. I mean, they're, they're just they're, they're uneducated. And I'm not talking about whether they have a high school degree or college. They're just uneducated and ignorant. And he ran circles around them in that, in that, in that movie. You believe? You believe in a global flood? You Christians, you believe that stuff? In a global flood? I mean, just... Hey... They found seashells on top of Everest and every other major mountain range in the world. How the heck did they get up there? Maybe the boys carry them up there. <laughs> but he's, he's just, again, he, this is the modern day attack and it's a shame because young people are being brainwashed by this clown. <laughs> I want to tell you this. I could not be a Mets fan with him owning the Mets. And if he owned the Yankees, I could not be a Yankee fan. I'm telling you, I'm like, I'm really fanatical with stuff like this. <laughs> Diocletian. He's the last of the ten emperors that brings tremendous persecution on the church. If you owned the Bible, you were killed. You were put in the arena or you were set on fire. And he burned as many Bibles as he could find. But here's again, it's just a picture. It's a picture of the, whether, whether it's the Roman emperors, it's Islam or communists or the, hey, let me tell you, people always look at the Roman Catholic Church. Roman Catholic Church killed Bible believers during the Inquisition. In fact, they, there may have been more Bible believers killed than Jews during the Inquisition. But again, with all the persecutions, with all the attacks, they failed. Voltaire, the French philosopher, set out and he said, with my pen in my lifetime I will destroy the gospel of Jesus Christ, disprove it, and it will be the end of the Nazarene carpenter. <laughs> and when Voltaire died, the Geneva Bible, Bible Society bought his house and they printed Bibles out of it for a hundred years. That's what he said to me. David Hum, skepticism, he wrote Leviathan, again, set out to destroy Christianity. And during this period, the gospel flourished under preachers like Charles and John Wesley, Martin Luther, John Knox. In, in our own country, how many of you realize this? The founding fathers of our nation, the Puritans and the Pilgrims, were devout Christians. A lot of people think that all the signers of the Declaration of Independence and our Constitution were Christians. Most of them were Deists and Masons. But, but Thomas Jefferson, Christianity is the most perverted system that ever shone on man. Mm -hmm. The author of the Declaration. He wrote the Jefferson Bible. I have a Jefferson Bible in my study. Every supernatural passage is crossed out. No resurrection of Jesus, no miracles. And then Thomas Paine in the Age of Reason, and he brings one argument after another against Christianity. Anybody, again, who has even a limited knowledge of Scripture, you can refute what Thomas Paine wrote. But the attack, I mean, they mock, they ridicule, they joked, and they attack the Gospel as the Gospel just spread like a wildfire across the United States of America with four great revivals led by Moody by Billy Graham. Look at what's happening in China right now. You look at communism in the Soviet Union, Cuba, and Venezuela. But China, the, the, the persecution, the burning down of churches, the attacking of Christians. Many of our brothers and sisters are in, are in prison, in gulags in China. And it's believed that there could be as many as 100 million Christians 
in China, far more than the United States. And they're not living in the comfort that we're living in. In fact, I, I went to a, a prayer, I went to a prayer, this prayer vigil from pastors and leaders from all over the country down in Baton Rouge, Louisiana a number of years ago. And I'm sitting next to these three, these three Chinese women who didn't speak English. And they had come from China. And they got up on the platform. I didn't know who they were. They just sat there, you know, making niceties with each other. And they get up on the platform, and there's kind of about 3,000 people. And they give a testimony that in China, where they were leading a church, they did not have a building because the Chinese had plowed down all their buildings. So these women said what they would do is they would pray, and they would go to an open field on a Sunday. And nobody knew where the open field was, but the Holy Spirit would bring thousands of people to the open field where they would have a worship service. It was going on in China. How about with all, all the persecutions by, by Islam in the day and age that we live in? You know, it's amazing, in light of all of that, you know, what happened in Ethiopia this week, they burned 10 churches and killed, I think, about 30 Ethiopian Christians. But in light of what is happening, you hear some of the stories coming out, and you can see them on YouTube. Muslims who the Holy Spirit is revealing Jesus to in dreams. There's no more missionaries left. And they're laying in their beds at night and the Holy Spirit is coming to them and Jesus is speaking to them and they're giving their life to Christ and they're coming out and professing Christ, putting their life on the line. How about these characters? The new atheism. And they're attacking, they attack the faith every day on their little TV shows and in their books. Let me just ask you this, and again, this is something that amazes me too. When I was an atheist, I didn't really care if people believed in God, because why would I try to disprove something I don't believe in? You ever think about that? These guys really work hard to disprove what they claim they don't believe in. It would be like me standing up on a Sunday and saying, 10 reasons why the Easter Bunny does not exist. <laughs> Let's go through each point, and I'll prove to you today that, I mean, if you don't believe in the Easter Bunny, you're not going to try to just prove. I mean, there's something going on in their hearts. I just want you to understand that. There's some type of a battle going on in the hearts of these characters that are making them do what they're doing because if you don't believe in something, you just, you know, you don't want to bother with it. So again, the, the, the gospel attack after attack after attack. <clears throat> and all it's done is get bigger and stronger and more effective through the last 2,000 years. And all of the philosophies, right? There they are, the broken hammers. The, the broken hammers of paganism, of atheism, of Islam, of, of the heretics, of the secularists, of the humanists, of the satirists. And today, you have over 100 million copies of the Bible sold every year. The Gideons give away a Bible every second. And there are now over 2,426 languages. 95% of the entire globe is covered with the Bible. And when you look at the Roman Empire, where is it, right? There it is. It's in ruins. When, when you look at the, the Stoic and Epicurean philosophers, where are they? They're dead. When, when you look, when you look at, at Voltaire, where, where is he? There, there he is. You can go and see the tomb. Or you look at the leaders of communists, the communism, Lenin, and you can go to the Russia and you can see in Moscow, there he lies. And the hammers just continue to hit and they continue to break. Jesus said, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That, that rock he was talking about was not Peter. That rock was the very confession of Peter that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. It is the confession of the gospel that will endure and will survive and thrive for thousands of years until he comes. So the gospel is defensive. And let me give you one more. The gospel is offensive. Yes, sir. And it makes it very clear, right? It is the gospel of salvation. In Ephesians 1.13, in him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So the gospel is, is the, has the power, it has the power 
to save. The power to save. And it's on the offensive. And it saves us from three things. What does the gospel save us from? The devil. One thing the gospel saves us from is our sins. And their penalty. Mm -hmm. Because we've all broken the commandments of God. And it saves us from our sins. What else does it save us from? It saves us from Satan. Mm -hmm. Satan is described in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, as a roaring lion who walks about seeking whom he may devour. He's a murderer, Jesus said in John chapter 8. He kills. He causes sickness. He causes disease. He causes disasters. I believe he's behind 9-11. I believe he's behind the war in Syria, the war in Yemen, the war in Afghanistan, the war in the Ukraine, the drug war going on in Mexico, the havoc that's going on in Venezuela, what's happening now in South Africa and in Indonesia, in Chicago, in the United States. The Las Vegas odds makers place odds on how many people will be killed each weekend in Chicago. And you can bet on it. That's sick. That's sick land. It's a country. You know what I'm just going to say something to you? I believe, well, you know, this is, it's happening in, in predominantly in, in a neighborhood of color, African-American neighborhood. And um, it's horrifying. Like these, these, these drug gangs, what they do is they take 12 and 13 year old kids, get them hooked on crack, and they're the hitman of the, of, of the gang. It's not, it's not some big old Italian guy who's 50 years old named Luca Brasi goes out and shoots people. They take a 12 and 13 year old kid, get him hooked on crack, and then they set him up to go and shoot the other gang members. And when they're shooting, you put a, a gun in the hand of a 12 or 13 year old kid, all these innocent people. Little kids are getting shot through windows in their homes. Little girl, three years old. And, and I just want to say this to you. Pray, pray for Chicago. Pray for our inner cities. Pray for Newark. Pray for Camden. Pray for Patterson. Especially those of us who live right here. We should be praying in New York. Because I, I do believe if that was a white neighborhood, that wouldn't be happening. I'll tell you that right now. I'll get the Democrats and the Republicans, I don't care who they are, it wouldn't be happening in a white neighborhood. There would be such outrage if it was happening in a white neighborhood, but it's happening, it's happening in the black neighborhood, it's happening in the ghetto. And nobody's doing anything about it. The president wanted to send in the uh, National Guard. Uh, the leaders in Chicago said no. I don't know about you, but if I lived in that neighborhood and I was afraid that a bullet was going to come through the window and kill me or one of my kids or my grandkids, you can come in, please. Put an end to this. But that's the work of the devil. That's the work of the enemy. The drug epidemic that's killed 50,000 of our people in the last 365 days is the work of the devil. He's a roaring lion. He wants to destroy you. He'd like to destroy you your body, your mind, your spirit. He would like to destroy your marriage, your family, and your children. And Jesus came to save us from him. He's got a well-organized army of demons. Read from Ephesians chapter 6. Principalities, powers, rulers. This is what it tells us in 1 John chapter 5, 18. For we know that Whoever is born of God, it says, does not, does not sin. In fact, let me not freak you out with that. The word is hamartia, and it means to intentionally miss the mark. In other words, the person who is born of God is not intentionally rejecting Jesus, his salvation, his lordship. We still will fall short of the glory of God. But he who has been born of God keeps himself, and the wicked one does not touch him. Now, the word touch is have to, and what it means is to basically an animal getting its claws into a person or another animal. Have you ever seen a raccoon? I had a guy here in, uh, in Dumont a number of years ago. He goes in his garage, and there's a rabid raccoon that grabbed onto his shoulder, basically dug its, its, its claws into his arm, and started eating away on his shoulder. It did real damage to the guy. <coughs> and that is have to. That is, that is, he, he, the devil cannot get his claws 
into the life of a true believer. He can tempt us, he can oppress us, and he can deceive us. But he cannot get his claws into us and get control of us. That's what Jesus came to save us from. And if we walk in his spirit with the armor of God on, he's on the defensive, and I'll show you that next week. But he came to save us from the devil, and he came to save us from hell. He came to save us from hell. And you know, how much does God hate hell? But it was never made for people. Who was it made for? For Satan and his angels. Matthew chapter 25. It was made for Satan and his angels. But, but how, to what lengths would God go to save people from hell? Look at what he did. He was innocent. And he's plastered up on that cross. He's whipped. He's crowned with thorns. He's spit on. He's beaten. And the physical pain of being nailed to that cross and hanging there six hours and dehydrating and dying, it doesn't compare with the spiritual pain that he suffered being separated from his Father in heaven when he cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? How badly and to what way would he go to save us? Look to the cross. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He came to save us from our sins. He came to save us from the devil. And he came to save us from hell. So it's a defensive power that has endured for 2,000 years, not just survived, but thrived. And it is an offensive power to save from hell, Satan, and sin. So it is the gospel of boldness, it is the gospel of Christ, and it is the gospel of power. Next week again, we'll look at these other things. I want to just give you a quick application here and just simply look at this. First again, I'll just review, it is the gospel of boldness. And the person who has the gospel in their heart will have a boldness to confess Jesus before others. Some of you will do it loudly and some of you will do it softly, but all will do it. And it is a boldness to approach the throne of God when we need mercy, when we need His grace, when we need His healing, when we need His forgiveness. We can come boldly to His throne even when we have failed Him miserably. It is the gospel of Christ, the good news of Messiah. We can't separate the gospel from Him. He is the gospel. And it is the gospel of power that has endured and will endure to the very end and saves us from sin, Satan, and hell. And I say this to you today, if you have not taken that gospel into your heart, do so today. Take it into your heart. I'll show you something next week where the scripture says that the kingdom of God is advancing and it says, and it suffers violence. Mm. And people say, well, that's the violence of the devil. No, that's not the violence of the devil. That is the intense response of a person who wants to be saved. It is almost appears as violence. When the kingdom of God is before them, when the gospel is presented before them, they grab onto it. That's what I did. It was probably the most violent moment of my life. I have never made a decision that was more intense than that decision. I, I, have, I have never made a choice that was as powerful as that choice. No choice, no, no decision ever that I've made in my whole life has been as powerful as the day that I made the decision to take Yeshua into my heart to be my Lord and Savior. So that's why it appears as, as, as violent. But it is the power to save from sin and save from hell. Mm -hmm. If you have never opened your heart and done that, do that today. Do that today before you leave this place. Let today, September 2nd, 2018, be the day of your salvation. I remember my day. January 15, 1984, was the day of my salvation. 
pray that you today would be the day of your salvation. So would you bow your heads? And I'm going to ask 